Okay, so welcome everyone to our latest Tap Solutions webinar. Um, these lunch and learn sessions are designed so you can grab a coffee and something to eat and hear something new in between meetings in your busy day. Um, well, I'm delighted to have Rachel Ellison, MBE, with us today at Tap Solutions on our webinar. Rachel is joining us to talk about her experiences of global leadership through her coaching experience and has written a new book on the subject, but more of that in a little while. Just before I introduce Rachel, I just wanted to let you know that you can type any questions you might have in the text box, and we'll try and get to some of these at the end of the session if time allows. So, hi, Rachel. Welcome. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to your listeners around the world, Anthony. Thank you so much for inviting me on to TAP Solutions webinar. Not a problem at all, and um, I just realised we've got a half-second delay on this, so um, I take that into account so I don't talk over you. But Rachel, welcome, and do you want to just introduce yourself to the listeners about um, your back, a bit about your background? With pleasure. I started off as head of photocopying and buying chocolate bars for my editor on a national Sunday newspaper in the UK. I began at the bottom and I was willing to do anything so that I could learn. And I think learning is the theme that runs through my career. It wasn't conscious, but it is now. And increasingly, it's what's demanded of the workforce to continually be open to new learning, uh, career restarts, uh, career cul-de-sacs. Uh, learning a new career altogether. That's what the uh, statisticians predicted for anybody born after 1970, that we'll probably have to have three different kinds of career and job. And all that's about being open to learning, being resilient and being flexible. Um, I began as a news reporter, uh, researching and buying tea, as, as I mentioned at the start, and then moving on to writing my own stories. And I learned a lot from working in a commercial newspaper environment. I really wanted to get into the BBC, a public service broadcaster, broadcasting to 120 countries around the world in 60 different languages to audiences of 185 million people a week. I wanted to go there because of its values. I wanted to go there because uh, I listened to the BBC, I watched the BBC, I, part I partake of that product and I wanted to be part of that. Uh, it took me six years to get in and eventually I did and I ended up as a news reporter and then uh, ended up being flown around Europe and then into the former Soviet Union and Central Asia, uh, specifically Afghanistan, where I was asked to do a project uh, on human rights and media aimed at girls, their mothers and their grandmothers. And I remember leaning into my boss and saying, but you do know I haven't done anything like this before. And he leant back in towards me and said, you do realize, nor have I. And that was my first leadership role. I had a team of one and I just thought, I really don't know how to do this. But ideas and creativity kept coming. And to me, that showed me I was in flow and something was working um, and something came. I was working hard, but it felt like work easy. So from that, I knew to listen to that energy. Um, I was in a new place and happier in my career than I'd ever been. And uh, that led to me volunteering to be a coach, an internal coach, and eventually me starting my own external coaching business, which has seen me coach across 40 different cultures from Myanmar, Burma, to Afghanistan, Kenya, um, Central African Republic, Senegal, Sudan, Somalia, Iraq, Syria, uh, China, Indonesia, the UK and Europe. And I can hardly believe that I have gathered that much uh, coaching experience in the 10 years that I've been independent um, uh, post BBC, post the broadcasting career. And that that coaching has taken me across banking and retail to electronics, logistics, pharmaceutical, government, uh, including the Brexit ministry has been very busy uh, with all sorts of employees working uh, against their values in many cases, asking for coaching to help get them through. Um, I also coach uh, N NGO workers uh, around the world and they've really extended my learning and it was some of the them who inspired my book, uh, which uh, is in the shops right now as of this week, it's called Global Leadership and Coaching, Flourishing Under Intense Pressure at Work. And it was when I heard some of the stories from these leaders that I started to ask, really, should it be only me hearing this or could more people hear this and more people learn from HR to leaders to uh, our future leaders? And it was with that in mind that I um, asked permission from some of those leaders if they would be prepared to do an interview outside of the coaching space uh, to see what we can learn about what it takes to be a highly effective leader in their field and what the rest of us could learn from them. 
And that's great. That's a fantastic picture that we've just painted of your career to date so far, Rachel. That's, that's fantastic. Um, and a question I wanted to ask was, I think you just touched on it a little bit there. It's like, you've been external coaching for 10 years now. I know you did it internally in the BBC before. But why now? Why write a book now in 2018? Why do you think that's a, a key moment for either your career or, or the world at large? I bet if we asked ourselves and all the people listening here and some of our best bosses that we've ever had, how did they plan it all? I bet you if they were honest, they'd say they couldn't possibly have planned it. This sort of evolved and I feel that stories dropped into my lap and I literally sat there thinking this is so inspiring. I think more than just me should hear this. And so the book evolved with one thought leadership piece with two questions. Uh, to recap what I said earlier, the two questions were up throughout the book are, what does it take to be a highly effective leader in your field? That could be from retail to a refugee camp, to a racetrack, to a prison leadership environment, to hospitals, to a war zone, to coaching someone in a cafe. And my second question to each of those leaders was, what, what can I learn from you? What can somebody ordinary who's, you know, wishes they could get a seat on their train to work and is feeling very stressed and trying to juggle home and work um, and changes in the workplace. Uh, what, what could we learn if we just go to an office rather than a war zone when we go to work? And I was so inspired by the humility as well as the passion of the different leaders who agreed to be interviewed because many of them had an absolute clarity about how somebody sort of very ordinary like me um, could feel stressed. Uh, one even said there is a call for humanitarian aid in the most ordinary of offices. You don't need to be in a theatre of war for there to be a need for humanitarian aid. She said, here's an example. She said, look at the people who work long hours, who forego seeing their partners or their families, who have a lot of business travel. They're not eating properly. Many aren't sleeping properly. Um, some can't even digest their food. They're so stressed. Surely this is a call or an example of the need or an illustration of the need for humanitarian aid everywhere, not just um, in uh, where there is disease and desperation and poverty. She felt there was a, a poverty in, in the most flourishing and um, profitable of offices. And that had me think, and this book is about giving leaders a place to think, giving HR professionals and coaches supporting leaders to stretch their thinking, to hear new input. It is so fascinating hearing about something that you may never do or never even touch, like go in the inside of a prison, and then to see what we can reflect of with reflect upon within ourselves. And yeah, I, I mean, I, I was lucky enough, as you know, to read one of the draft copies of, of your book, which is, um, so I've, I've got the inside edge on this. And I know that the way you've designed it is very much around giving an example of, of, of one of these leaders um, around the world in a certain setting or a certain sector, but then actually provoking some questions at the end. And I was just thinking, what I haven't seen that very often in other books, and I was really intrigued to know how you came by that kind of style to actually deliver the book. So I think it's, it's really interesting, and it really got me reflecting and thinking heavily, and I'm not someone who does that quite easily. That's a lovely question, Anthony. Thank you. I would say the style is, and I'm going to read you some, some quotes from the leaders because I think it's really more important that we hear from them than we hear from me about leadership. Let, let's hear what it's actually like. Um, I thought I'd share with you a, a chap who works in a, a prison environment. Uh, as a journalist, I happened to go inside a prison and it was really scary. This guy works in there all the time and he is convinced that prison isn't the right answer societally, um, but, uh, and he is convinced about the, the um, aim of bringing work to prisoners so that they can come out of prison and, and have work. And that means they, have an, they can have an address and they can have a livelihood and they don't have to keep um, cycling around the, the, um, the criminal cycle of offending, reoffending, going inside, becoming increasingly known to the police, offending again, getting caught and going inside uh, a prison for, for longer. And inside prisons, you then get the, the power and the, the gangs and the risk of debt and, and further crime. Um, and he is, he is uh, re referring and, and resourcing himself with um, the resilience he needs to keep working in such a difficult environment 
uh, but he's also really practical uh, and he, he um, incorporates his own troubled childhood in terms of how this informs his leadership and his empathy and understanding for the prisoners who are after all his customers. He has a duty of care um, towards society in terms of protecting society from uh, potential uh, violence or uh, offending from these prisoners but he also has a duty of care for those who are locked up. Um, it, it's got to be a safe place to keep people locked into but if a fire breaks out you've got to, it's got to be a safe place to ex evacuate people to. So it's a real tug of war about how to get this leadership right in different environments. So I can read you a, a quote right now, but the, the way the book evolved was to hear the voice and the story of the leader, to ask those two key questions and to keep anchoring it back. And actually it was almost like a workshop design. Um, the questions came to me and I, I just um, put them at the end of each chapter. You can dip into this book in any chapter order you like. The reflector questions are there and People who read it, I, I tested it out on a few leaders first and I said, do you like the questions or do they annoy you? And they said, it gives me a space to think. I can do more with the material I've just read because you've got me thinking. And each time I come back to this material, I find something new to think about. Um, some of them had questions back for me about the, the case study or the research. This is original research. It's not from a library. I'm not an academic and I have to go out and earn my living. I wrote this book in between uh, gaps between clients. So it's very much applicable, accessible. Um, and again, it's where I shine, which is telling other people's stories with balance and fairness and going beneath the surface. I don't shine if I sit in a library referring to other people's literature. So what I'm hoping to bring listeners today and readers is something fresh and inspiring. So let me read what Phil, who works in the prison environment, says. There were flames shooting everywhere. Staff were dragging prisoners out. They were giving them mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. The prison officers were incredibly brave. A prison riot is about life and death. It's not like a tricky meeting. I think a lot of people describe as difficult management is about first world problems, like I'm in Waitrose supermarket and they've run out of anchovies. Resilience is the ability to endure. It's not about bouncing back, according to Phil. It's about being able to endure anything that comes at you and just keep going. Now, I question Phil's definition of, of resilience and endurance, but his background is he's the product of a, a child brought up on a council estate with two mainly absent alcoholic parents, no books, uh, no homework, uh, no meals. So. For him, he had to endure and endure and endure until Mrs. Jones at school suggested he stayed on and did an A-level because he wasn't sure whether he wanted to leave school and go into the building trade like half his class or go into petty crime like the other half. And she said, how about you stay on? And then she said, when you've got one A-level, you can do two more. And he ended up going to university and on the graduate trainee program for the um, prison service. And that's how he ended up as a governor. And I asked him, how does his terrible disadvantage of his upbringing, something that leaves him quite shaky even today as a married man with children, how does that inform his leadership? And I'll tell you what he said. He said, I've learned never to judge people. Don't judge your prisoners. Don't judge your prison staff because you don't know what they may be struggling with. And to the point about resilience, I think there's a theme for many of us in many different professions. There is a difference between being in a resilient state, working really, really hard to get to the end of a project for a specific pressure deadline. It's quite different to be in a hyper endurance state as a permanent lifestyle. And there is a thought that many startups, for example, and some of the big corporates expect a sort of corporate athleticism. They're expecting people to work in a state of long hours and rushed meals uh, and foregoing your emotional needs or need to just rest and relax uh, and, and operate in a state of endurance. And the psychologist I heard speak about this uh, actually at the Coaching at Work magazine conference uh, last summer spoke about rest and digest. And she said, if you're an athlete, you have hard endurance training sessions every day but also scheduled into every day is rest and digest. And she said, that is what you need to create elite performance. Uh, just enduring and just res being resilient and just working and working and working will not produce, ultimately produce elite 
high performance employees. You need the rest and digest. So there we have from Phil, his empathic uh, understanding of prisoners from his own background where he says he could have gone either way. He could have ended up in prison or he could have ended up running one. In fact, he had to lock a couple of schoolmates up once because he found they were actually in his prison. And it was a very delicate situation, dangerous for, for both sides. Um, and uh, we, we have the, the thought about corporate athleticism linked to the idea about what is endurance and working very hard and what is resilience. Um, one being a healthy temporary state um, and the other being uh, an unhealthy um, state that will not produce optimal performance ultimately. So that, that's Phil in, in prisons. Wow, and uh, I mean, there's so much you can take from that. I was just jotting down some notes, and um, I, I'm just thinking uh, the rest and digest. I think is is really quite interesting, actually, because um, I was doing a leadership program last week, and one of the things we were saying to people is actually you need time to reflect to actually then um, enhance your performance going forward. Um, you nothing will ever change if you carry on going through the hamster wheel as you are now. I think there's something around the world of resilience. I think we talk about that in leadership circles at the moment quite a lot. And I also love that the don't judge because you never know what's going on with the other person. And, and I was thinking of the whole Jahari window thing in, in leadership about what's under the surface, what I know, that, um, what I don't know, but you know, but what things the nine of us know. There's, there's so much under the personality that that, um, that can come to the surface if you don't judge people first. And so that's great, Rachel. Thanks so much um, and I was just thinking have you got another example from the book obviously you don't want to say the whole book because some people won't buy it um, but have you got another example from the book you think that the listeners listening in at the moment might be interested in well uh, let me give you a choice uh, I coached one person he said he wanted to get out of the office I coached him on location in an art gallery in a library in a, a railway station cafe so you can have location coaching I had another lady, uh, this is a cross-cultural, multicultural example. She's Sudanese, Western-educated Ivy League University in America, um, from Sudan, and she works for an international NGO in, in a war zone. Um, and she said she got the worst coach because she got me. So what do you think would appeal most to your audience? Um, well, I never thought I was going to have a choice, which is amazing. Um, and in this position of power that I am at the moment, I am definitely going to have to go, Rachel, with the one that says that you were the worst coach, because I know that's not true at all. <laughs> but I also think that the, the diverse element of, of, of Sudan and everything actually might bring some fresh insight as well. So, yeah, that one, please. All right, let's have a go. She says, I got the worst coach, the youngest coach, and a woman in a country that's not your country, you can even walk naked. Now, I'll, I'll go into what all that means. We, we were in a, a global leadership program being run by an eminent business school in the UK. And this Sudanese client saw the lineup of coaches and we were all assigned each other. We didn't really get a choice. And she saw uh, the, the older women. She saw the man with grey hair. And what she really wanted was the man with white hair because he would be the oldest in her assumption. And he would be the wisest in her assumption. And these assumptions come from her culture, which has taught her that both those things are true. And I said, ah, oh, and you got me. And she said, uh, yes. I said, the worst coach. And she said, yes, exactly. I said, yes, um, and a woman. And what I had to do in that moment as the coach was hold the insult, hold with that and be able to contain whatever feelings that gave me. The funny thing is, it turned out we have the same birth date and are the same age. But she made these assumptions about how to get the wisest coach because the older person would be wisest. And of course, this is held in many, many cultures uh, around the world. There are some shifts in it. Another thing that was difficult was for her to speak to a coach at all. She said, I must admit, I was very stressed about our first meeting. I thought, how am I going to talk openly to a stranger for an hour and a half? You see, in my culture, going to a psychiatrist is acceptable, but not a coach or a counsellor. If you want counselling or mentoring, you go to your siblings, your auntie or your neighbour. It's a very challenging concept to open up to a person from outside one's community. And yet further along in the coaching conversation, she said this Sudanese saying, in a country that is not your country, you can even walk naked. 
And what she meant is that you can, her tradition was you go to your community for advice. But actually, when she came outside of her community to speak to this weird Western woman in a different country from a different culture, it was as if she could walk naked. She could say things that are not sayable or not acceptable in her culture. One of them was that she did not want to marry and that she does not have children. And I think there was quite a lot else that was that remained unsaid, but remained understood between us. She said that the fact that I had worked in a country she had also worked in, in Asia, made her feel she could speak to me in a more meaningful way because she felt that I would understand different cultures rather than just be a tourist having a holiday. And that enabled more of a connection. So I'm very much into connection over perfection as, as a coach or as a leader. Uh, in it, it enabled more of a professional connection for her to then be able to open up and say these were her coaching issues, these were her leadership issues, this is her self-doubt. And what it shows us in a, an intercultural context is what baggage do you carry from your culture? She assumed she got the worst coach because of the baggage she was carrying from her culture, her cultural conditioning. In the end, we laughed a lot about this and she said actually she got a great coach and that it was all working out rather nicely. Uh, hence her agreeing to do this interview and be a part of the case study. Um, another really profound thought here is from a, a colleague included in this um, case study who is white and did a piece of work for mental health uh, care trust in the Caribbean. And as he walked in, they said, ah, Hawkins, an interesting name. And he didn't realize that as Mr. Hawkins, the coach who was thought he'd be helpful, he didn't realize that his name was the same as that of a very powerful abusive slave trader. And the learning there is that people who are white in a, in a white majority don't think of themselves as of color. This man walked into a room not realizing that his name evoked a, a terrible power dynamic that he didn't realize he was bringing into the room. So there's our conscious baggage, there's our subconscious baggage the Jahari window, not knowing what we don't know, we've just brought into the room or evoked for the other side. So I was young and female and this evoked for the Sudanese lady that she'd got the worst coach. This guy goes to the Caribbean and he evokes oppression and a domination um, history from the past for the very people he thought he was going to help. So in a, a multicultural world uh, and increasingly um, mixed uh, teams, even uh, mixed race blended families, we are going to need to learn and become increasingly open to the baggage that we have just brought into the room that we didn't realize. Um, in one more little example from the, the, the chapter with the Sudanese woman and the, this uh, white man in, in uh, the Caribbean, was one more uh, female coach who was older and whose client said, you're so understanding, you're such a good coach, it's like talking to my lover. And she, the coach, completely freaked out on her side and went into a sort of Freudian field day where, of course, uh, she got caught up with the fact that she wasn't his mother and she, he made her feel terribly old. But, of course, for him from his culture, East African, um, he thought that was a huge um, evocation of respect for her and admiration and feeling his issues were held in a safe place and that she was a caring as well as professional coach so each side for, for each side this this phrase meant something so different um i think it's exciting it's uncomfortable and i think coaching and leadership development and growing yourself professionally is all about increasing your capacity to sit with the discomfort and to explore difference not diminish it and to ask about whose culture is dominant here um, and to ask what baggage you have just brought into the room that you didn't even realise. And Rachel, I don't, there's so much there, isn't there? I mean, I'm, I'm just thinking around the concepts of diversity and inclusion, and actually, in that case, being to, to have that sense of inclusion, you need to talk openly about your differences first, because you wouldn't know that you had the surname of a slave trader in the Caribbean unless you could have a safe place to do that talking to actually get that out there. And I think that that's a very interesting thing to actually maybe take back into business ourselves to actually get 
that sense of inclusion. You actually have to go past the tricky stuff first and get it out in the open in a safe place. Um, and I think it, it kind of comes back to emotional intelligence really doesn't it about your own self-awareness and almost a cult there's a phrase cultural intelligence which which essentially is emotional intelligence with a cultural lens um but it's um very much about what are my filters what am i excluding from what i'm seeing and hearing because i come from a culture where actually it's just like wallpaper but it could be very different for someone else so it's that's super interesting uh, rachel I'm, I'm keeping an eye on the clock we're coming towards the end of our time together and I think we talked about so much already but um, go on then give us a plug for your book where can we get hold of it and and is it out <laughs> now let, let us know uh, 30 seconds of that <laughs> okay so one sentence which is within this book is a call for higher ethics and diversity in leadership for higher profit productivity organizational sustainability and joy in coming to work this book is small and intense a bit like its author I'm going to give you an author discount code. You can order it off Amazon. It's called Global Leadership and Coaching by Rachel Ellison. And it's also on the Routledge website, the publisher Routledge, uh, which is uh, in, available internationally, as we know, in the US, uh, as well as the UK, Europe, and Asia. The discount code is AUTHOR, in capital letters, AUTHOR227, AUTHOR227. And... Um, I hope people enjoy enjoy the book very much, and I'd really like them to be leading better by this afternoon. That's fantastic. Thank you very much, Rachel. And, and I hope everyone listening in got something from that uh, conversation there. Um, just to let you know, this isn't the first webinar that Tap Solutions has done. We do re webinars on a regular basis. You can find the other ones back at the Tap Solutions website, tapsolutions.com. We also, six months ago, started a podcast channel after a number of people asked us if we could do something along that line. So we release podcasts every two weeks with really interesting people, just like Rachel. Um, if you want to find that on our website or your or iTunes or wherever you want to go. Um, so, yeah, um, I would just like to say, Rachel, thank you ever so much for your time today. That's an absolute and pleasure. I'm thrilled you've got <laughs> so many hundreds of listeners dialed into this. And that's great. And thanks, everyone, for listening. Um, if you have any questions or queries, do reach out to us at TAP Solutions. Uh, other than that, have a great afternoon, evening, morning or night, wherever you are, and speak to you soon. Thank you very much.